I'm actually calling from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, my question is, is sort of two part. As a veteran, I tend to look at things by way of strategy and tactic. Um, the two part question is this, um, ultimately, public policy will be the determinant. Um, how do we get people to understand that moving beyond protests to the public policy? And I, and I bring that up uh, in lieu of, I, my assumptions are that the, the concept of the protest and what it has meant has come by way of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, however, I think a lot of people fail to realize that ultimately his objective was to affect the public policy. So how do we get people to understand what it means now to move beyond protests to affect public policy? Great question. Who wants to take that first? Well, I can start. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, uh, uh, as everybody knows, uh, you know, both of us on this panel are, are academics. And uh, one of my jobs, I think, in terms of advancing this um, is to teach. Uh, I've found that, uh, you know, uh, it was important uh, to teach in the you know, civil rights class that I have, uh, the history of disfranchisement, um, the relationship of the struggles to vote back in the day, as they say, uh, and it's that, that relationship to current forms of voter suppression. Um, and I think people get it. Uh, I think once people, uh, you know, see uh, that when we're talking about the civil rights movement, we're not talking about something that died or is over or, you know, uh, succeeded. We're talking about a struggle that's still going on. Um, and I think that it's very important to make those, those kinds of connections. And I try to make them uh, as a scholar. Uh, so I think there, there is a, a role for, for education here uh, and uh, there's a role for convincing people that despite the flaws of the electoral system, it's really important to, to get in there um, and to do what you can to change it. So um, if I uh, can add to that, that was just such a great um, uh, uh, support for the project of universities. So, so thank you, um, Professor Plummer. Um, I, I would say that um, Mr. Estrell, um, I, I don't think of protest and policy as being sequential. Uh, I think of them as needing to coexist. Um, and, and so um, if you think about this sort of crucial period of civil rights movement, just as an example, um, you know, 60, Three, sixty-four, sixty-five. Um, you know, the the, the movement um, was seeking social change. Um, the movement wasn't seeking the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? That particular crucial landmark piece of legislation became a goal, a goal that um, that you know, partly because of the legislative skills of President Lyndon Johnson. Um, you know, he was able to sort of cobble together the level of bipartisan support to get a very strong civil rights bill through Congress. But, but that didn't need all the, um, all the needs of the movement, all the needs of communities of color around the, the, the United States. And, you know, LBJ then turning to other matters, but can't because, you know, my former congressman, John Lewis, and other civil rights um, activists uh, put their lives on the line. And one of the things they did is they marched over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and just got brutally uh, beaten. Um, and that kept civil rights on the agenda. And that was part of the context that helped uh, lead to the passage of a landmark Voting Rights Act. So, so you see, it, it wasn't um, but, but, you know, that might make it look a little bit sequential, right? But basically the goals of the movement were broader than could be captured in any piece of legislation. You're so right that you have to be, some, people have to be strategic 
but there's not one grand strategizer, right? There's instead the movement seeking change um, as quick as possible. Uh, some you know, group that is between political leadership and the movement and has membership in both perhaps, sort of coming together and saying, I think we can get this kind of bill through. That would solve the following important problems. Then you get enough movement support for that you get enough political support for that and, and, and you sort of do it without that, that, there wasn't a sense at the time that the Civil Rights Act was passed that that was the be all and the end all, right? It was just a piece that could be passed. And so then political leadership think check mark, we're done and I can do other things that are gonna help me get reelected. Uh, and, and then again, it's the movement. So, so I basically think that we need to be comfortable with the protest. Um, the protest is democracy in action. It's the people having a voice. And that's, um, I think that one of the you know, best things that can happen is for people to be able to speak politically as they can. And it's much more effective to have a social movement like that than, I mean, my husband's version and you know he's fabulous, but he actually has been, I don't know if he's still doing it, but but start, started writing individual letters, you know, old fashioned letters with postage to his um, senators um, every time something happened. And, you know, and that's really important. And it's great to have those pieces of paper, sh paper show up in the local Senate offices. Um, but, but, but the movement in Atlanta has had a bigger voice than him, obviously. Um, and, and you need to have sort of across the board, um, a broad political action that people listen to and hear. And you know, the thing about a movement, it gets, it gets in the media, people have to address it. And you know, my husband senators actually, you know, nothing's gonna happen to them politically if they ignore my husband. So, so again, you know, the movement has a role, um, it has to be listened to. Um, and, and then legislation is a, is a fix and important, but it's never encompassing everything that a social movement wants. Um, and so the process of change and strategy and protest have to be sort of, uh, you know, continue together, you know, through time. So, so that's the way I would look at it. Fabulous. I mean, it is a tall order, right? It takes time and energy and mobilization and capacity to go out and protest. And one of the things that, of course, everybody has talked about a lot in the last several months is the, the, you know, the tragic fact of an increased unemployment, especially amongst young people, has created an opportunity for young people to engage in protests on Monday morning rather than having to make a choice between going to work. And so I think there is also this sort of practical question of you know, what happens when that's not, um, when that, if or when that situation changes, you know, how much does the, the current, the contemporary situation of those who protest affect, right, their ability to sustain the movement. Um, you know, I just think the current moment is just extraordinarily interesting for so many reasons, but not least that one. Um, I was in Omaha, Nebraska a few days ago, and my nephew was facing this choice. He's been out protesting every day, and he said now he's working, and it's a little bit more complicated, but they turn up at night, and that's more complicated because then there's a question of what happens after dark. Mm -hmm.